Well, <laughs> hello and welcome. I can't believe I'm still standing actually after today. <laughs> Goodness me. Three hours sleep. It's a rock and roll lifestyle for the man in the high vis jacket. We have had the most amazing day. We are here at your Glasto and it's by you for you with you all that we need here today is you we've had young people on the stage here today we've got Lenny on tonight this is Lenny's day a young lad from Sheffield he's already been on BBC Radio Sheffield tonight and he's going to be live here tonight so look what's going on here we have built a pyramid stage in the last few days in a school in Somerset and these are the aerial photos from the drone unbelievable sight here it's an unbelievable sight and we are now going to go live. I'm going to jump up onto the stage here because we've got a stage display and I'm going to cut across to my man Chris Sullivan. I've got to make sure I've got the right buttons all ready to go here, which I haven't. So let's just press that. Let's have him on that one. He is on six and there is Chris Sullivan. Chris Sullivan is live and direct. Let's just make sure we can hear him. Chris Sullivan, can you hear me? Yes. Good evening all out there. Looks like it's working. So we're not going to waste too much time tonight. Chris should be glad to know. We are mm. go we're going to crack on. You're on a stage. You've got some I Love Art posters. We've got a Love Music, Hate Racism signage up there, which is actually the rebrand of Rock Against Racism, which you'll remember from back in the day. Um, yeah, well, I was there. You were, we were all there, weren't we? Those are good gigs, weren't they? Did Victoria Park, uh, was it? That was one of the big ones, wasn't it? Well, the big one I went to was uh, in South London, Brockwell Park. That was a big one. Remember that as well, yeah? Yeah, it was uh, very hot and sweaty. Was it a hot and sweaty day, was it? Very similar it to was, today, yeah. possibly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very yeah. similar to and, today, and it was very similar to what you saw the other week with all the, um, the I I English Defence League. A load of uh, uh, National Front supporters uh, jumped on in. Unfortunately, what they didn't uh, realise that there was uh, the trades union movement from from the South Wales miners were also there. <laughs> Some handy lads then. Yeah, so they were sent with their tails between their legs, which was rather like the one that happened last week. That is exactly uh, what happened, isn't it? Because it didn't get played out. It is, yeah. D they were shouting, you know, and then all of a sudden, when they went to Waterloo, uh, 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 you know, a, a lot of young sort of black kids and Asian kids from all over London all met them and thing and just battered the living daylights out of them. Which is true. You shouldn't, you know, you can't come to my city and Bob's city and your city and shout that stuff. We are racist and proud of it. It's not happening, you know. London's Absolutely. a cultural society, and that's what's so great about it, you know. You can't be doing that. Chris, I had about two hours sleep last night, mate, and I've been on my legs since like, 10 o'clock this morning. We were live on yeah. BBC. We believe this. You won't believe this, right? 10 o'clock this morning, I launched a dynamite rocket out of the window live on BBC Radio Somerset. That is what, oh, that's what BBC Radio is all about, isn't it? You know, connecting with their communities, crazy stuff like this. And yeah. I'm, I'm not being funny, but you've been, you've been a rock to us. This, this, this fire pit chat thing is about those little chats you might have at a festival. Not that you've ever been to one. You haven't got a clue what I'm talking about, have you? But yeah. I yeah, I went to one once. I didn't last very long, though. <laughs> so basically, you get, this is what happens, right? You go to a festival, you go out all day, you come back to your tent, you have a bit of a wash and scrub up, and then you have a chat with your mates and then go out again tonight. So that's what you're doing. And you've, got, you've, oh, right. you've, you've absolutely hammered your black book for us. You actually, uh, you, ma you managed to blag me onto BBC Radio London a couple of years ago and I had a chat from a lay-by in France, funny enough, as I was driving back from holiday with this, yeah. this, well, this next chap. And somebody texted me and said, you know what he's just said? He's just said, because I was back in the car hammering it, and we couldn't get Radio London in France. And he said, I've just had a chat with an inspiring bloke. I thought, love that. So I'm, I'm dead chuffed you got him on tonight. And I can see him loitering in the wings. So I'm going to press yes, a button yes. here. Hang on, we can't hear a word you're saying, Mr. Elms, but we can now. Get, what, Mr. Elms, I'm delighted to meet you. Can you hear us? Indeed I can. Can you hear me? We can. This is amazing when it works, isn't it? Now, I'm not being I funny, Robert. Know. I've got to just turn this camera off because I don't want anybody seeing me in the corner. So we can see you. We can hear you. Right. I'm going to let you guys crack on because I, I don't know what, how often you get to catch up. I can't you, see Chris at the moment, but I don't, I'm, I'd don't. i sort of prefer that. You're not going to see him because we're, we're a bit advanced. There was a, there was a level of technology that you could have had as an option where you would have seen him and Chris felt that was a bit out of your, um, out of your technology comfort zone. So we, we, we left that. My technology well, comfort zone. My technology comfort zone. It was getting all a bit complex. <laughs> Guys, I'm just going to press a button that gets rid of me, and I'm going to leave you two on the to have a bit of a chat for about 25 minutes. If that's cool, go for it. Catch up, spread the love. Yeah. Ready? Yeah. Hello, Bob. Hello, Chris. How are you, mate? Yeah, I'm okay. Yeah, not bad. Not bad. It's, it was wondrous. This newfangled technology, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, imagine what lockdown would have been like without all of this. Jesus Christ! Can you imagine? It's, yeah, it would have been. You know, never mind the the the, the violence in home going up a third would have gone up about forty times, I think. Crikey! Yeah. This is what it's like being in the Middle Ages, I guess, wasn't it? Really? Oh, even no, even the Middle Ages, more like nineteen sixty in Merthyr Tidwell, where I come from. <laughs> it's still like that in Merthyr. <laughs> it certainly is. Pigeon post. Yeah, but we're here tonight basically because uh, both but both Bob and I are most recipients of. Uh, uh, creativity or being given the opportunity for creativity in schools and both of us are now, now our parents and uh, we realize the uh, importance of, uh, of of creativity teaching creativity in schools but the other thing is what I want to speak to Bob about I remember many years ago when you said to me he says you said you told your mum you wanted to be a broadcaster and she said other people do that yeah that, the, at, the exact line was maybe even better than that I said I wanted to be a writer and she said oh writer. Robert but they have people who do that. Not other people, just that they have people, assuming that yeah. I probably wasn't a person. Yeah. <laughs> say, yeah. Well, probably some people these days would probably think that, wouldn't they, really? You didn't come from Eton or something. But anyway, that's another subject. But, you know, I, I mean, reading your book, which is an excellent book, which is uh, kind of out now in all good bookshops, um, uh, it's at London made us. It's a memoirs. Oh, it's hard to say. A memoir of a shape shifting shitty. <laughs> and um, yeah. yeah, but it tells a story basically of you know your your you as much as anything your your family coming to Notting Day, which was you know ab abject squalor back in the day. It was it was the worst slum you could possibly think of, and your mother working on the buses and then going to that thing. But this has all come about where you are now is through education, is is it not? Yeah, it absolutely is that. I mean, I came from a family that didn't own a book. And I came yeah, from you, Billy. Yeah. I came from a council estate that didn't have a bookshop, but it had loads of bookmakers. Um, mm. But my dad and my mum both encouraged me to learn and encouraged me to talk. They used to have a fantastic thing called the arguing hour. When my dad died when I was very young, but I still remember it. On Sundays, do you remember they would be on the radio, they'd be sing something simple, and they'd be the yeah. top of the pop chart. And yes. then after that, the radio would get turned off. And I don't think we had a telly. And my dad would yeah. say, right, let's have an argument. And he would sit and talk <laughs> around the table. And I had to take part in it, as long as my two older brothers and my mum and dad. And we'd talk about politics. We'd talk about culture. We'd talk about sport, we'd talk, whatever it might be. And I just think that was a fantastic way of, of, of introducing you to the idea that your opinion matters. And also, you better have something to say. Yes, yes. And it was yeah, that and was I, just a form of education, really, for the working classes. And was that when you first, you know, you've always been a voracious reader. Is that when you first sort of welcomed the written word, as it were? Yeah. I, I, I used to go to the local library in Burnt Tokyo, at a, a rather ugly 1960s library. But it was a fantastic place because it had Treasure Island. And it had 20,000 mm. leagues beneath the sea. And then it yeah. had the Communist Manifesto. And it had the ragged trousered philanthropist. And all of these yeah. books that I wasn't, you know, growing up where I was growing up, I, you weren't really meant to have access to that. But they'd given it no. to us for a form of socialism. And that was just the greatest gift. Yeah, yeah. It was the same for me. I'd walk home from school and on my journey home was the Mirtha Tidville Library. And I'd read about Vasco da Gama. I was really into sort of explorers. You yeah. know, it's the same. I read Dickens. I didn't have the only books I had in my house were plastic, and there was nothing. There was no pages in them. They were purely for show. But as I said, <laughs> I was lucky enough to have a mother like yours, who, 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 who you know, we encouraged reading and, and art and all that. And it's because of that is where I am now, and I guess it's where you are because you, you know, you, you and I together, we both embraced all kind of creative uh, uh, endeavors at one point. And. Uh Absolutely true. But I also, I must admit, we used to get a newspaper delivered. I think most people did back then. You got the milk yeah, we, delivered yeah. by a milkman and we got the newspaper delivered. And our paper of choice was the Daily Mirror. But this was the Daily Mirror back in the 1960s and 70s that had yeah. John Pilger um, yes. and had, yeah, we had really great left journalism. Yeah. And so that yeah. taught me that there, there's there's stories out there there's there's argument out there i loved all of that and i used to think yeah. oh one day i'd like to do what john pilger does i mean i didn't i ended up presenting a radio show about 
you know, pop music mm. and trousers. But yeah. but the idea <laughs> yeah. that you could communicate with people on mass was very important. Yeah. But I, I, we had that paper as well. And I remember, do you remember the picture of the Hells Angel biting the head of a, of a pigeon? Remember that was in the Daily Mail. <laughs> yeah, that weren't you, <laughs> is it? <laughs> but I thought, that's very beguiling about behaviour. I wonder if I could be one of them. It's almost like a pirate. Um, no, same as me, we had to deliver the Daily Mirror as well. And as I said, it was, you know, it was a good newspaper then. And, and fundamentally, it was, you know, it was, it was for us. It wasn't deprecating or it just didn't patronise. And this is my, my dad was a trades union member and all that. So it kind of fitted in with, our, with, with what we thought. But also, as I said, the great thing about that was we had libraries, which are sadly, sadly dying out, are they not? But you've supported also, them on. Yeah, go on. I also, I mean, the, th the libraries was absolutely true. My local library, I don't think I would have done my job without it. But I also yeah. had, you know, I was thinking the other day, I was completely a child of socialism. I was born in a council house. I was delivered by a, a, a midwife of the, of the uh, National Health Service. Because my dad died when we were young, I had free school meals. I had free education up to the age of 21 you know, at the London School of Economics with a grant mm. and paid to do it. So I am an yeah. absolute product of that post-war Labour government. And a living, exa a living example of how successful that is. Yeah. Because look because what you I do now and probably the tax you pay and that you're enriching all these other people's lives with your daily highly rated show. How many people like that woman on today said, you know, the one she said, oh, you've done so much for me during this period with the books and everything. I mean, you, you're, you're, you're an example of how socialism can work. Yeah, I think I am genuinely and I think I was very lucky. Because yeah. I think I grew up yeah. in that period of time before that was assaulted by Thatcher and the, the neocons yes. and yes. all of that stuff. Yeah. Well, we were lucky. Same as me. I got my grant. Same thing. Exactly the same as you in 1978. Yeah, me too. So, yeah. And, so, and to be honest with you, if I hadn't had that grant, I wouldn't be here now. No, and we wouldn't have met each other and we wouldn't have gone to New we York have. and we wouldn't have, have done all the things that we've done. Because people yeah. like us weren't meant to travel around the world. We weren't meant to have debates with yeah. important people. But that gave yeah. us a route through. And I am eternally grateful for that. But I'm also slightly yeah. saddened that I think yeah. a kid growing up on the Watling estate now would find it much harder. Oh, it's terrifying. Like, you know, I, I, I Merthyr Tidville, I met this one kid recently who was, who was, who was a very talented uh, chemistry student. And, you know, he, he was he was off. He was going to go to college. But he said, he said, I don't want to be like Johnny Sporks, his brother over there. Or he went to university. He, he, he ended up he ended up coming out. He can't get a job. Now he's on the bench every day. You're 65,000, can't get a house. And he's an alcoholic. And oh, that is tough. putting people off like that. Which it is all the tremendous talent. That. We might have the new Louis Pasteur out there. You know, we might have the new Dickens. We might have the new Karl Marx. We might have the new Picasso. You know, but they they're not getting a chance. And so this is what this is kind of all about. You know. Yeah, I think we were also lucky because we emerged at a time when people were learning the kind of importance of diversity, if you like. I mean, you know, yes. first going to blitz together and realising that if boys want to dress like girls, that's fine by me. If if yeah. someone's of a different language, well, that just enriches my life. If someone's been to other places, that makes it more interesting. Do you know what I yeah. mean? We, I, I think if, like, I look at my older brothers and they came from a slightly more conservative time. I think we came mm. at a time when suddenly all these things were opening up. And punk was like important for that as well, Chris. That was a big part well, of our education. The door. Yeah. Hello? Hello, Chris. Hello. Yeah, you went for a minute. Yeah. Then. yeah, I think punk opened the door and showed us that we could do it, you know? Yeah, that message, which was, you know, there's three chords. Here's three chords, start a band. But it wasn't yeah. just about starting a band. It was yeah, here's it, three chords. Here's a photocopier. Go and make a magazine. Exactly. Or here's a fashion design or here's a, a, a film, yeah. you know, whatever you want to be, really. That message was really, yeah. really important. Yeah. Yeah. It's, which is, I'm interviewing Don Letts on Sunday about this very thing. It's like with him, he said, he said, I wanted to be a filmmaker. So I just bought a second hand Super 8 and did it. Yeah. And, and I wanted and to it, look good. And I, so I bought a, a Moe jumper off of Don Letts. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And it goes round and round. But no, I think Punk certainly opened the doors. And I think this, I'm hoping that this, what's happened now with this whole COVID thing will make people rethink things. And I think that things like this will encourage young people again to have a go and just do it. I mean, we opened those clubs. We didn't have nothing. We didn't have enough money even to make flyers, I don't think, for Samaritz when we first did our club together. All we did was go up and say, you know, we, you, you take the bar, we'll take off the door. But don't you think one of the other things that was important then, and I'm not saying money doesn't matter. My dad was a trade unionist too, and he wanted more yeah. money for his members. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. it wasn't about money. The profit is a good thing unless it's your motive. Yeah. Do you yeah. know what I mean? The profit well, we motive we, is not good. Profit's fine. Yeah, it's good to make money. Not for money. It shouldn't be why you do something. Yeah. Well, as you probably are, I've never done anything for money. So, uh, unfortunately, as you look at my bank statement, I'll tell you, tell you the truth. But what I'm saying is we didn't have money to, to do what we did, running clubs and all that stuff. We start, we, we just we just made it up as we went along. And I th I'm hoping that this, this whole COVID thing will encourage other young people to do what we did. I'm hoping. Hope or maybe they're right. house, you know. I hope you're right. I think it, what it might do is it might create... Don't forget, you know, when you first came to London, London was basically broken and empty. There was exactly. nothing in Soho. There was nothing in Covert Garden. Exactly. Therefore, there was lots of possibilities. Yeah. And this is where I'm hoping that there'll be a lot more space emptied with people paying lower rents so we, they can walk into a club and so on and give, say, give me half the door, you know? Or start a clothes shop or start a gallery or whatever it might be. Or a bookshop or whatever. So, you yeah. know, because, you know, a lot of businesses are going to be closing down and these, these landlords are going to have empty properties. So let's hope that, you know, they can put them to good use and put you know, art galleries, bookshops, record shops, just get independence back into the centre of London again. Yeah, I agree completely. But I am optimistic. I think young Me Londoners too. at the moment are fantastic. Oh, fabulous. Me too. I mean, they've got a spirit of a rebellion against them. You know, I only had, you only had to go on that Black Lives Matter march. I went on the other week and it was, you know, it was all young people, you know, and they were out there say, doing their bit. I've got, I've got immense faith in the under 25s, you know, yeah, maybe under too. 30s. I don't know, you know. Yeah, I, you know, I'm a parent of a couple of them and they're, yeah. and they're political and they're committed yeah. and they're creative. I mean, the only thing is, I think they, they you know, they're finding it hard to find somewhere to live, for example. That's a big issue in London now. Well, this is what I'm hoping that, you know, there's going to be a lot of office space freed up. I know that for a fact. So I'm hoping yeah. that maybe they will they will start putting these office spaces, you know, back to residential housing. That's what I'm hoping. Yeah, maybe some squats would be good again. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Is, but there's going to be lots of empty buildings, isn't there, really? Yeah, I, I mean, one of is. Alan from the WAG, he, he works for one of the third biggest uh, uh, owner of, of property in Soho. And he says, he says, virtually there's one thrown in their lease every day. He says you're going to have so many flats, so many premises empty. So maybe that will, they'll open the door, you know, for independence to come in. Let's hope that becomes an opportunity because I do think that, as much as, you know, things, some things get better, the corporatization of this city and, our, you know, of this world has been the yes. biggest problem. You know, a world run by big companies is, is not a good thing. No, I, it, it's an appalling thing, really. Because, it, you know, you think about it. it, it but the thing is, these, these kind of right wing administrations are trying to encourage, you know, uh, um, sort of young entrepreneurs and amongst the young, but they can't, they can't get a foot off the ground because before they know it, they're smashed by the corporations. Um, I mean, so there has to be some legislation, I think, to help these young companies get up and going again, I think, because the, co the corporates are just, you know, they're the ones that's driving the rents up. Look that's at Mark amazing. Hicks. I mean, he was, he was asked to, his rent went up three times in his restaurant because some big corporate chain was willing to pay it. No, so that's mad. It, it completely defeats the kind of creativity that we came up through. Yeah. Well, that's what I said. I, I described it as, you know, it's like as if I signed up to go for this really interesting, typical sort of meal in a really good out of the way restaurant. And halfway, of, halfway after my thing, they give me, a, give me a McDonald's. It's not what we signed up for, you know. No, it isn't. And I don't actually think it's what people want either. 
I mean, no, yes, right. some people, you know, want to go and get get McDonald's or Kentucky Fried Chicken or something. But I think many yeah. more people would rather have the yeah. Wag Club or the Dirt Box or, you know, all those, that sort of guerrilla yeah. street creativity that we saw all the time. Yeah. And also a uniqueness. People go to Paris because it's Paris. They go to Rome because it's Rome. They won't come to London if it looks like Hemel Hempstead. No, you're absolutely correct. I mean, the only thing I do think, though, is if you remember when we were going out, yeah, we took over Soho and Covent Garden. Our yeah. kids are taking over New Cross and Tottenham. They, you know, yes, there course. is something happening out there. Oh, absolutely. No, I, 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 you know, Peckham and places like that. I mean, I'm, you know, it, I mean, I went down there recently and it's all kicking off down there. But as it's I said, but the, the important thing I think about the West End from my point of view, from our point of view, is more egalitarian in that if you have like, but a lot of the people used to come to our places, some came from, well, well, you used to come up from Tottenham and then you had somebody else used to come from South London and East London and West London. I think it's, it's egalitarian the West End. I think that when things happen on right at the end of London, it kind of ostracizes the other side, not not ostracize, you know, but bars them, if you know what I mean. Do you still think, I, I've got no idea, do you still think that kids growing up in Merthyr or growing up in, you know, Bristol or Glasgow, do they still look to London, do you think? Um... I don't think so. Not like they did. No, no. Because you think about it, there hasn't been a real movement from London, London centric art, music, fashion movement in quite a long time. Grime. grime and all of that. But that's, you know, it's not our world. But that I that guess that, I guess that. But he kind of I think it, it's it's hard for a sort of a white kid from a council state in Merthyr Tidville to get his head around grime. You know what I mean? I mean, I, maybe it is. Maybe it's not. Maybe I'm completely wrong. I'm not one of them. But I oh. don't think. It has the same allure, say, so we say the mod thing or the punk thing or the, it's kind of, well, we, you know, which, yeah. I, I mean, I don't know. It could do. I don't know. But, uh, do you, yeah, but, like, yeah. you know, London, I think, as I said, because the corporatization of both fashion and all that, I mean, we used to come up for individual clothes shops. Yeah. Is there a clothes shop now you travel from Merthyr to Tidville to buy clothes? That's that unique? To be honest, Chris, I can't think of one I'd go from Camden Town <laughs> that's just true, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely true. Because they've all been priced out, and because you know the King's Road is the best example. I mean, you, when was the last time you went there? Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, one of the lines I was quite proud of in my book. I, I talked about London having no go zones because you know there's yeah. all those Americans are terrified of coming to London, and I said London mm. does have no go zones. Knightsbridge, yeah. Kensington, yeah. the King's Road. <laughs> Why would you go there? That's right. Why on earth would you go there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. They were once, as I said, Kensington, King's Road were once magnificent. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, because it was kind of arty and it was a little unusual. You had old antique shops and you had this and you had that. Like, don't forget, you know, Acme Attractions was, was in the antiquarious antique market, you know, but it was cheap enough to have a space there. Same mm -hmm. with Kensington Market. I mean, you know. That was, you know, there was you could get a cheap stall there for like some, you know, something like five pound a day, you know, and 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 it, at that point it welcomed people to come in and try their hand at making their own clothes. Like, well, Vivian Westwood, perfect example. Her rent was really cheap. Now yeah, but you did have to put up with the smell of Afghan coats as you walked in. <laughs> I remember that when we used to go into Kensington Market, the whiff of like <laughs> that old damp leather smell and the, the woolen smell with the, and they tried their best with joysticks. But I think that just made it worse. <laughs> All right, Bob. So your book is out, is out now. Do you want to tell it? It's about before we go. So, yeah, the book is called London Made Us. It's currently out in paperback, and and it's it's a memoir. It's my memoir and my family's story. But I hope it's also a story of all of us who've lived in London or spent time in London in this period. Which is why it's London Made Us rather than London Made Me. It's a book about. Yeah the way that a city shapes you and you shape a city. And, um, and, you know, I love this place. I'm from here and of it. And you were one of the people who got London straight away. Yeah, well, I, it's like as, I, I, as soon as I came here, first time I felt instantly at home. And no other city has matched up to it, really, even New York, L.A. Something about no, London that just suits me. All towns are small towns compared to London, as far as I'm concerned. So... No, this is this yeah. is my place, and you're right. Maybe post COVID, it will get even better again. 
Well, I'm, I'm really hoping about this because we re, the dial needed to be reset in all kinds of ways. And I'm praying, not that I'm religious, I'm praying to my fan, which is in front of me here, <laughs> my, my electric fan, uh, that it will make a difference. Because it's these sort of cataclysmic things that make the difference. And I'm, I'm, I keep on telling people, after the plague you had, that was the end of serfdom. After the, the great Spanish flu, we had Paris in the 20s, probably the most vibrant, creative decade ever. And also the Roaring Twenties in America, you had Berlin, you know, the Weimar Republic. So always after these well, disasters. Second World War, you had the Sixties, really, which is how long it took. So, well, that's absolutely true because don't you know, as people forget, you know, like you know, well, but we you, we've said this before. I mean, when we were born, it was only like seven years after rationing. <laughs> <laughs> You've made up for it since, though, Chris. <laughs> I certainly, hey, that's why, you know, hey, in Murphy Dinville, it was more like, you could, I mean, I'd never seen a tomato till I was about 11. <laughs> I'll introduce <laughs> you to a banana at one point, mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, there's an interesting story before I go. My father, he was given a banana once in 1945, 44, and he, he didn't eat it because he knew he'd like it too much and he'd want another one. Gonna, so that's, that tells you something. I'm anyway. a sausage. Yeah, a sausage. <laughs> anyway, so Bob's books are all available. Thank you, Bob. Lovely chat Thanks, again. Guys, I'm back. That was absolutely beautiful. It really, really was beautiful. And, and I know that you, you didn't read the manual, Chris, and you didn't dare pass it to Bob because you're a bit worried he might actually freak out with the tech. But if, you've, yeah. if you know anybody in your house, Bob, who can get you up on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube to see what you've just done, it's beautiful. You are now both on a pyramid stage in a school playing field in Somerset that's been built out of cardboard tubes and bits of cardboard and you are both projected up there now. This is powerful stuff. At eight o'clock, a young lad with cerebral palsy is going to go on that stage and play a 30 second piano riff for the, for the world. There might be six people, there might be 60, there might, whatever. Unbelievable. Yeah. I've just put out a tweet. I, I loved your comment, Bob, about profit is not a bad thing unless it's your motive. That is yeah. what that is driving schools. We have got somebody in this country who runs the largest network of private schools, academies. And do you know what his former career was? No. Lord Harris. He was knighted or given a lordship for donations to the Conservative Party. I'm not going to get party political, but his claim to fame was flogging carpet. He now runs the biggest chain of schools. What was his motive? Fluffy feet or, um, or money? Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. whatever. I don't want to get party political. I'm only interested in policy that affects creativity, kids or communities and all our futures. Bob, Robert, thank you so much. Been amazing. Well, really amazing. I think uh, both Bob Let's and I, we this. come from the same cloth. We both benefited <coughs> from exactly the thing that you're trying to push. So thank you, Bob. And we'll speak soon. Huh? Thanks very much. Bye -bye. Wow. How good was that? Wow. Thanks for that, Chris. That was, that was fantastic. So, right. um, well, the funny thing is, I loved it when it went quiet and then you both thought the technology had broken. And there was nothing wrong with the technology. It's just you both stopped talking. You couldn't see each other. It's an interesting dynamic, isn't it, how that works? Well, I thought there was a delay, you see. So there was a slight delay. So I thought he would say sometimes it wouldn't come. It wasn't coming through. But anyway, that hey, brilliant. the thing is, you know, no, nothing like a bit of silence makes you appreciate the noise, as they say, you know, it's well, like it, uh, absolutely. hot and cold. There's a little so bit next of... up, we have John Mitchinson. So how am I going to find uh, him? Is he... <clears throat> did, he get, did he get his Skype working, do you know? No, you just have to call, get, get in touch with him, he's waiting now. Okay, okie dokie, let me think I'm going to do this. Where did you send his um, Skype address to, Chris, just so I've got it? Uh, it's <coughs> just John Mitchinson, all lowercase. Okay, this is public, so let's not worry too much about the details, okay, that's fine. Oh, okay. So, yeah, <laughs> that's all right. John, he's going to have a load of people um, spamming him now on... Uh, on he, Skype. He, he, I think this is going to be the last time he uses Skype because he uses all kinds of other technology. Anyway, he said he's <laughs> resurrected his account just for you. So. <laughs> Here we go. I'm like an international telephone exchange operator here, aren't I? Oh, <laughs> oh I can hear somebody giggling. There's a bit. Hey, of, bit that of chuckle I heard. That's how like the job. Oh, here we go. Hello, John. I'm just going to have to. I'm going to have to turn this window off. I've got a bit of a bone to pick with you, mate, because you're taking the Mickey out of the fact we're using Skype. Is that right? Uh, well, <laughs> I, it's just that as as the world seems to move to Zoom, yeah. I'm just wondering. Yeah, whatever. Is it? Is it 
Doesn't it, matter. There's methods. No, he wasn't to... taking the Mickey. He was suggesting another more, more easier platform. It's fine. I'm only joking. No, it's John funny because said, w- old men only old men use Skype. Not 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 John. <laughs> John. Not John. <laughs> I'll be honest, God, with, old man. he's spot on because I just went with what I knew because I've not used Skype for years myself and I thought, well, I'm going to use that. I didn't want to get into video conferencing. It's done the job. It's fine. But whatever. Here we are. John, thank no, you so much. Here we are. Let's get over it. Yeah. It's have you, exciting. Are, have you got a second screen to hand, John, by any chance, or just that one? You haven't got another tablet or a laptop to hand anywhere? It doesn't matter if you uh, haven't. If you've got one on the phone. desk there. If you've got a phone, go to the, go to the Steam Co. YouTube channel and you'll see the video that's going out. Um, okay, cool. If you want to, it's the Steam Co. YouTube channel, and then you'll realise that you're actually now currently on the pyramid stage at Glastonbury with a bunch of kids sitting in front of you. <laughs> a, a, a pyramid stage that's been built from cardboard rolls and flat sheet cardboard by a bunch of dads, <laughs> because this is your Glastonbury. It's by the people, for the people, with the people, and I think the work you do with Unbound is exactly that, isn't it? It's very, it's very collaborative. It- it is, but we, we do try. To, we do try to keep that vibe. So vibe I'm going to leave you to. If you do put YouTube on, can you make sure you keep the audio down because it will feed back. Just yeah, use yeah. that for a visual. I'm going to leave you to it. Chris knows what he's doing. I'll speak to yeah. you in about 20 minutes or so. Thank you very much. Excellent. All right, John. Hey, Chris. How are you doing, there, John? Nice day up in oh. up in your neck of the woods. It is. It is. Um, it's fine. Yeah. It's. It's. We were. We've been hanging out for the. Uh, for the thunderstorms that haven't happened unfortunately oh well, yes say, unfortunately too, but it's it's well it's so fine, really, for everybody it? out there for the reason why john john basically is uh is my publisher and he publishes loads of books uh, many books and has been in the publishing business for a long long time and is you know very erudite and well-read man and uh he also uh, was with a man who came up with the idea of a QI, which is as good a bit of information exchange as there ever was. But uh, also his 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 uh, book company, Unbound, is is a is a, a very radical. It's almost like a punk version of um, of literature, really. Because if you have an idea, no matter how wacky it is, you can go to John and he, you you put your stuff, you 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 make your proposal, you write the chapter, and then. You get his crowdfunding, then you get as many. But the the best thing about this is crowdfunding. But if the book is good and it does well, he, he takes it on to another stage in the bookshop. So it's basically That's almost it. like one of those little sort of record labels you had many years ago that would give a punk band or a little band a studio. Then they'd release it on a, some small label and all their friends would buy it. And then they'd get signed up and get in every record shop in the country. So is would that be a, a, a description, John? That's a very good description, Chris. I mean, obviously, as it, as with everything, you can't, you know, not many are called, few are chosen. But we are much more accessible than traditional publishing where you have to get an agent. And you have to, yeah. uh, you, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, the, the, the gateway is very, very narrow. So we, we take a much more generous view with, if, we, if we like the proposal. And and we think there's a we can see a way through to to, to somebody raising the money. We'll uh, we'll back yeah. it, and if it works, as I say, we can get distribution into bookshops, yeah. but also, you know, uh, overseas into America, all that kind of stuff. We've just started that this year, and that seems to be going really well. So, um, yeah, because I think the parallel a, with a record company is very is is apt because of course the record it is, company yeah, yeah, it is. Some... I mean, we feel we feel much more like an indie label. That, that's exactly yes, how we, yes. we would describe ourselves um, of the old school, you know. So it's good. Yeah. And uh, when when did you you because you, you we did the punk book together, of course. Me, you, yeah. me, me, me well, and the. I mean, I, I, and so, I'll give you the, the the story. Really, was was uh, was that I was working in traditional publishing. I'd been I'd started off as a as a bookseller. I started off at Waterstones in the early days. I like to think of them as the glory days when we were opening lots of bookshops yeah. on high streets all over the UK. Lots of towns, uh, you know, places like Middlesbrough, which had never had a good bookshop before, and uh, you know, open up Waterstones, and the people would literally be crying because they couldn't believe that they, they were going to get a proper bookshop where there was a huge range of stock, and you know, there were events. Mm. It was, it was. So I did yeah. that, and then um, I suppose I'd got to a point where I felt I'd done what I wanted to do, and I was interested in publishing, and I went into traditional publishing, worked for a small. We bought out a small, very literary, uh, very cool list from uh, Harper Collins called Harville. And then I did a. Uh, after that, I went to Orion, which is a much bigger publisher, and ra- ended up running a list called Castle. And that's where you and I first met, uh, Chris, because yeah. we were brought together by Stephen Colgrave, who now 
is running the Byline Times, which we both write Which is an entirely still. admirable publication. If you want to get yeah. real news about what's Absol really happening, Byline Times is the only one, really. Absolutely, it's brilliant, isn't it? It's one, it's one of the, the yeah. and I think it's it's now the officially they not only do they it's a bit like us, you know, they're kind of like a label. Not only do they have a festival and they have an online thing, they actually print a bloody newspaper, and it's the fastest. Yeah. It, well, on, it was print and comes out once a month, but it's the fastest mm. growing newspaper in the UK. Anyway, that was that was really how um, you and I met, and we worked on the punk book together. I'd published the Beatles anthology, which had been a huge bestseller, and I thought, well, hell let's do let's do something for um let's do something for punk and we yes. i remember we were sort of tickled pink by the idea of having a 40 pound big yeah. um sort of uh coffee table book uh, um, art book dedicated yeah. to the, yeah art book really dedicated to the ephemeral um yeah. uh, uh kind of uh period in in, yeah. in 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 history known as punk but of course what you did as the writer of that book was you, yeah. you like the mycelial growths of a fungus you you yeah. stretched all the way back into Warhol's factory in the '60s, and uh, and, sure. and made the whole the evolution of both what mm. punk was and what it what it, where it started and what it turned into. So it was a much bigger yeah. and more ambitious book than we'd originally thought. And and of course, you know, it was it was basically redefining it as something important in history, but uh, culturally, I think that was what I wanted to do with the book. You know, was was to to put place it in a space. We'll say, listen, this is this is up there with the pop arts. And you know the impressionism, and because it, it, like rather like Gustav Corbe was probably one, of, probably the first punk who, by the way, he said anybody can paint, and he used to do paint in schools, and you know and he was banned from all kind of places for doing nude paintings and all that, and he also believed in, you know, he's a great socialist and believed in the people and the people's rights, and that's why he did paintings of you know potato farmers. No one had done that before. And Absolutely. so you know it, it does as much wealth as that because it does it was more than just um, uh, just uh, music and a few t-shirts well, and think, all that I business. I would, I would say, Chris, and I, I don't know whether you'd agree with me, but I feel that the that spirit of um, uh, always feeling that you should be doing your own thing, expressing yourself, mm. um, you know, finding ways of getting your stuff directly to 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 to, to the mm. people. I mean, I. It's maybe hard for kids to, today to, re, to remember just how total the control was in those days of television, yes. of radio. You know, there was, yeah, there was yeah. the, the, un, the underground. You really had to fight quite hard to discover the underground, didn't you? And, and yeah, what, yeah. You pioneered, we, what you pioneered, obviously, in, in club culture. And, but hmm. people, people we, uh, the punk thing really was about doing, you, doing your own stuff finding your audience yeah. and doing it directly and i think that's yeah. that spirit is, is 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 what's driven you in your career and it's definitely what's driven me in mine um yeah you know even in a strange way when we can mm. uh, you know after i left castle I, I was thinking about going to another publisher and then i had a conversation with the legendary comedy producer john lloyd who happened to live in i live in a village in oxfordshire and he happened to live in the same village and we basically we sort of between us we, we we made a plan he'd already kind of had the basic idea of qi but we turned it into something we were going to do television we wanted to do radio we wanted to do books and uh, in most of those cases um it did, wasn't radio but the, the, an amazingly successful podcast has, has has spun off it and obviously the tv yeah. people know about and the books have sold millions of copies so uh yeah it wasn't a bad that wasn't a bad afternoon in the pub all things told but it and again it kind yeah. of had we did it in our own we did it in our own way, and we we, we trusted yeah. the audience. You know, we didn't trust the yeah. the focus groups of the BBC. Um, yeah, and it was really in. The, I suppose my, I suppose we've been doing QI for about. It must have been getting not quite ten years, maybe seven or eight years. And I wasn't particular. I was enjoying doing it. You know, you know how I love the, 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 the research, researching and writing the books. But a couple of friends of mine had come to me. I suppose the the, the recession had happened, hadn't it? Ended the. Uh, 2000s yeah. it was sort of 2008 2009 and we're getting books turned down left right and center good books you know not um books yeah. that would have absolutely been been taken on um and we did again another classic pub conversation sat down with the two of them and and we said uh you know what would publishing look like if you started from scratch and i'd become aware i think it had just launched of a, 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 this crowdfunding site in fact the first time in the whole idea of crowdfunding i became aware of it was obama's election campaign where they they campaigned they got 
you know, millions of people to give small amounts of money. Instead of getting half a dozen billionaire donors, they got they went to the people. Yeah. Uh, and Which then, is what the Labour the Party just did. Yeah. Yeah. And then the, the, the site, the Kickstarter site had started. And I thought, well, this is quite interesting. This is sort of like in eight, in the 18th century when you wanted yeah. a book published. You would um, you would advertise and say you know for, uh, and ask people to subscribe. So you know mm. you uh, when Alexander Pope wanted to write a new volume of poems or Dr. Johnson wanted to write his dictionary, they would advertise and people would subscribe. And I suddenly thought, my actually what this would this would give this would move the power right back into the direction of the of the writer. If you were able to go up and say, hey, I've got an idea for a book or here's here's a story I'd really like to tell. Will you back me? And you got enough people to do that, and you got that out into the world. You were kind of re in, in a way, you were just sort of re-engineering the whole the whole way that publishing worked. It wasn't all about yeah. can I get my book. And you know, this is blown up in the last couple of weeks. Mm. I don't know if you've been yeah. publishing the following. Publishing paid me, and out of the Black Lives Matter uh, protests, uh, you know, mm. the, the spotlight has been turned on publishing and 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 just how how white it is, how how middle class it is, how London centric it is. And, um, yeah. and all of those, again, you know, I think, I think there's change in the air and, and it's something that's, that's, uh, I sort of feel we're always trying to be in the vanguard of this change at Unbound because we're, we're trying to connect readers directly with, their, with, 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 with writers and vice versa. Cause the energy, yeah. once you get that going, I mean, you remember, the energy is incredible, isn't it? And it's, I mean, it's how yeah. Glastonbury, we're talking about Glastonbury. That's how Glastonbury started as well. And um, if, you can, if you can do that, then you, I think you've not only, it, it's not only a good thing to do because equality is just an absolute necessity, you know, economic equality uh, uh, and a legal equality between all, all men, women, genders, and also, you know, all, all races it's it's an absolute given right in, in any civilized society that that is, is a good thing but there's also i think massive potential that so many areas of 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 of, of, of life are not being covered you know most black people aren't seeing stories about themselves being told you know uh, in, in in publishing houses and that's beginning to work if you look at the, the bestseller list this week it's full of black writers for the first time ever novelists like like Bernadine yeah. Evaristo who won the booker but also Rennie Edo Lodge's book about why I'm no longer talking to white people about race it's like there's been a it's almost like this is the the, the dam has for the for the first time properly broken and uh, yeah. you know we our book the good the good, good immigrant which was which was an important book it was, you know 21 essays by people of color that we published four years ago and it won an award and it's it's been it's been a massive, you know, we've sold 150,000 copies of that book. It's incredible. So mm. um, it's a good, yeah, it's a good, I mean, I'm, I've always liked to be, I mean, I've, it's funny, I occasionally get people, I, I met an old friend of mine the other day, he said, oh, you know, if you'd stayed in publishing, you'd probably be running one of the big firms by now. And I said, I never wanted to run one of the big firms. Yeah. I've always wanted to do, a bit like you, Chris, I've wanted to do my yeah. own thing. I've wanted to do yeah. the things that interest that something that interests me, and work with yeah. writers. I love working with writers, um, and I love yeah. finding new ways of, of, of engaging new audiences. As I say, not yeah. just because it's a good thing to do, which it is, but also because I think there's you know there's a vast untapped potential with new audiences. Um, so that's the like kind the of the, that's, thing that's the short that's the short the short sort of career history, I suppose. Mm. And of course, you know the. This this thing is all about creativity in schools and in, you know and yeah. uh, encouraging creativity and also but I, I'm I, the, all the people I'm talking to this weekend like yourself like Robert Elms who just on like Kemp Brothers tomorrow like Danny Ramplin they've all done it themselves and they haven't taken any quarter like neither have yeah. I you know it's like I've only ever done what I wanted and I, I the message I think to a lot of kids out there who are faffing about do what you like because you'll always be good at it. If you force into any job and you don't really, enjoy, you shouldn't be doing jobs. You should have a vocation. No. You should be doing something you love that you feel really into. And the only way you're going to find out what that is is by education, by trying, you know, having a go at writing, having a go at painting, having a go at singing, having a go at drama, yeah. all those things. And I mean, and these are the things that the government, yeah. which we hope, should be pushing for people now because yes. machines do everything else. I mean, you should, it's, I couldn't agree more with that. That that sort of that thing of of just um, 
a couple of things. I mean, we're talking about education. Plato, you know, the Greek philosopher said, uh, he said that education should resemble play. He said, because mm. it's through play that you find out what the, the, true, the true enthusiasm of the, of the human yes. being is. And, mm. and that's a really important thing is that uh, we've, we've made too much education results yeah. based and yeah. um and we it's it's not it's 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 not an opening up of things it's a closing down of things and i think that is that is uh, and one of the things about one of the things about creativity about about creativity which is a word that you know does get bandied around all the time creativity really starts creativity is is a combination of two things enthusiasm and hard work the enthusiasm yes. you need the enthusiasm you need to be you know when you if you want to be involved in music or you want to be involved in, 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 in drama or you want to be involved in making films, you, you've got to try, you've got to try and do these things. Now you might yeah. not be the, you know, you might not end up being the best in the world at them, but that doesn't matter if you, there are, there are now, there are now all kinds of ways in which you can experiment and practice, but that's where the hard work comes in. Cause if you do find something that you really love, you do have to work very hard. And unfortunately, in a lot of cases that hard work now, now more than ever means that you know it, you know the the money doesn't come easily in anything, and I think yes. you know you and I, you and I <laughs> you know and that I yeah. good examples yeah. of people who have always put our in, our enthusiasm before our, mm. our, our earning power. I mean, we, it's not like we we don't have a we have you know we have full and interesting lives, but you know mm. if if you want money, um, you know go and go and if that's all you want. Then you know that's all you get. <laughs> but but, um, yeah, but as I said, I know people like have done just that, you know, and they're they really and rich, they're... and you know, they have the they've you know, I know I've met a few couple. They're heads of hedge fund guy. He's the most unhappy guy on earth. Everybody knows he's a hedge fund yeah. manager. He's miserable, yeah. and uh, he's in work every day at like five a.m. He hasn't got a life. He's got two houses in Italy. He doesn't visit because he's too worried about the money he'll lose by not being around one day. Yeah. So money isn't everything, I mean, you know. That will tell people I, I, success is. I was so. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, just, just. I mean, uh, if you if you're looking at sort of adv giving advice, keep going, keep going. Keep going. Yeah, that's and, right. Keep going. And, and, don't and the other thing, of course, the great thing about what you and I are doing. Don't worry about what you and I. Sorry, it's echoing here. But the good thing about you and I doing, you can still you can do it all your life. The thing is, people yes. think these get rich quick. Britain's got talent. If you look at all of them, they're, they're here today, gone tomorrow. If you do something you work at, rather like the Rolling Stones or Miles Davis, you will do it from now until the day you die. If you perfect your art, if you're a painter, if you're a writer, these things, there's a certain amount of talent, but there's, you know, the talent comes. So you have to put the input, read in. And once you become good at it, it'll, it'll just get better. Well, that's another, another thing I was going to say. I mean, I, I know I would sound... It would be odd for a, a writer and a publisher not to say this, but it's something I try and impress on everyone is it doesn't matter if you're, you don't have to be a writer or a, or a, a publisher to want to read. Reading is the key. The more it you is. read, it's like, it's like shoveling in, you know, you're one yeah. of the best readers I know, Chris, you know, you read everything yeah. and you read yes. uh, and, and you always have, and you, and you push yourself and you, but stories, you know, being able to tell stories, being able to understand, being able to put your own life in the context of, of other people's, uh, you know, whether it's philosophy, whether it's it, it's fiction, whether it's poetry, whether it's history, understanding the past, you know, something we really desperately need at the moment is a better understanding of, you know, we've been living in this sort of a hundred years of thinking we were the good guys and that our British yeah. Empire was the was the greatest thing and on, on, you know and and everybody was really pleased to be part of it and it's it's like a horrible horrible kind of awaking from a horrible hangover and realizing no <laughs> yeah. that's not, I've got, yeah, that exactly. is not what was oh going God. on I've, I've gone and, and got and, drunk and, and, and robbed and you, you get that through reading you, know, you get that perspective through reading <laughs> which is which is why they 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 used to give like the sailors a pint of rum every day yeah. Off you go, kill all. You don't even know them, but it doesn't matter. Kill Nick all again, and you'll be right as rain. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there's, a, there's another famous there's another famous quote which I always like to is is from the French philosopher Blaise Pascal, and uh, he he uh, he said that that all of the troubles in the world stem from man's inability to sit quietly in his room. Now, 
as you and I are both neither not people who like to spend all our time on our own in our rooms. But if you don't, there's a real wisdom in that. If you're not happy in your own skin, if you can't amuse yourself, if you can't yeah. fill your time, I mean, you know, I'm never bored because I always feel there's so much more I want to read. There's so much more I want to understand. There's so much more I want to get my head around. And then when yes. I do go out, as we do, you know, we have a yeah. we have a much better time because we're you know, we've got. You know, I've usually got when we meet, Chris. We're always. Have you read this? Here are ten things that I. You know, did you know about that? I mean, I just yes. discovered today. I, I, there's, a, there's a whole continent, new continent, of which New Zealand, and the um, and 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 and, and, and New Caledonia are, are, the, are the only main bits that are visible, and it, it, mm. it's called. Um, it's called variously um, Zealandia, um, uh, or uh, I think there's there's another silly name for it. Yeah, it's Tasmantis. Although interestingly, <laughs> That's good. I, like that although, one. I mean, you know, I mean, this is how how do you how does a continent go missing? That's what I love. Yes, um, exactly. And of course, it is also there's now as of last year that the, there's a proper Maori name for it, which is which is Te Reo a Maui, which is the hills, valleys, and plains yeah. of Maui. Maui is the great the great uh, yeah. New Zealand kind of god hero figure who who caught the fish that became New Zealand. And, but, mm. I mean, isn't that, you know, that's, that's incredible. This is 1,900 square miles submerged continent that, we didn't, that I didn't know about. And that's the thing. Wow. It's, it's, in the end, education should be about wonder, shouldn't it? It should be about yes, opening kids', yeah, kids yeah. eyes to, yeah. the, to the glory. Uh, and, 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 the, and there's still so much that we don't understand. You know, get off. Oh, one thing. Look, we, we, all, we all use social media, but, you know, uh, honestly, a, yeah. a couple of days on social media and you're ready to top yourself. Um, That's right. Hey, the, oh, by the way, that that uh, book you 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 suggested. I mean, I see that guy's won uh, the Underground Railroad. I see he's won two Pulitzer prizes by now. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. What's brilliant his name? Book, Colston. Col What's Colston Whitehead. Yeah. Yeah, Colson which is White. quite funny considering the statue's been thrown in the river recently, isn't it? Really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, God. Yeah, but that's quite again. You know, he's he was on you know he's on the front page of the Guardian the other day, uh, the uh, the Observer, big feature. So as I said, you know, it's good. I think things are opening up, and I don't know if you agree with me, but me and Bob certainly thought that that this whole COVID thing, this entire debacle, might be a, a realignment, might might actually provide or provoke something interesting to happen culturally amongst well, the young young people I and otherwise. I feel that strongly. I feel one of the things yeah. is we have talking about. Pascal and staying in your room yeah. we've all had to learn to do mm. that uh, you know and actually and what think... people have found people have found out quite a lot of stuff and they've they, some yeah. of the stuff they've really enjoyed some of the yeah. stuff they've yeah. realized that they don't need to do all this shit that they, they fill their yeah. lives up with all the this one thing I endless think consuming mostly, yeah. and spending yeah. money and and, and 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 traveling to work you know maybe they don't need to do so I really well, hope I think, that. I'm, I'm, you know, it's I, been I'm a really nature send to me, you know, not a godsend, a nature send. It's all given everybody a bit of time to sit on their own and think about where they're at and what they want to do and Absolutely. what their position is. Absolutely. And, and I think for that, we, we've never had this time before. It's so fast, no. you know, it's something's out, boom, 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 especially with social media supposed to, you know, it, make, it, it just makes everything even more quick. So this has been a really, in my opinion, a good time for reflection. And as I said, it's just let's reset the, the 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 volume a little bit more, you know, and uh, see what happens. But as I said, you know, okay. I I keep on saying this: only good things can come out of this. I think. Yeah. Um, well, I, I'm I'm I know I'm an optimist, I, I, and I I will always be an optimist because what's the, you know yeah. the alternative, frankly, is. <laughs> Is, is yes, horrible. exactly. So, <laughs> it's not that pleasant. Um, but as I said, if, so, any, if, it, if, it, if there's any kids out there, I think young teenagers, or even not kids, even 20, 30, however old you are, I think I think if you want to do something creative, now is the time, I think, because I think if doors are going to open, it's going to be soon. I mean, you know, isn't that is, isn't that great? Because who would who would have thought that yeah. six yeah. months ago? You know, yeah, but it's amazing. Yeah. I do, I and, and I also I think. The people who say, which I think is a very interesting idea, that the planet is some in some strange way, you know, the idea of Gaia is somehow it, it's it's it, it, it's demonstrated to us that it is possible for us to consume yeah. less, for us to travel less, for us to be. So I'm, yeah. I'm very, I, I'm, 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 I, I, as I say, I'm optimistic and I think we will I, see this. I, we will see this as a good I, thing in, in years to come. 
And I think uh, really, I mean, I think the lesson that I'm hoping a lot of people will learn is people that's been deprived of seeing their loved ones and their parents and their sp- friends, etc. That what really matters are those things, your friends, your loved ones, your relatives, not the material stuff. Because I'm sure there was lots of people sitting indoors really missing their friends, but I don't think they were missing going on 100 miles per hour in their brand new Mercedes. Do you? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean I, I've been I've been really interested in with the stuff that has that I have missed, and it's generally what you would expect. It's human contact, isn't it? Literal human yes. contact. Yeah, yeah. But that's most all of, that's most what of it's been the, really, you know, most of the really. most of the stuff that I, I I you know writing, thinking, talking to people, a lot of that stuff I don't have to get on a train to do. I can do that from home. Yeah. Yes, yeah, things I've missed is just like sitting outside, out standing outside a pub on a warm day. I'm not having a pint with a few friends. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> That's about it. And, and, <laughs> I wish and, I could and, say and, there was more. I haven't ter- missed ter- expensive drinks. I haven't missed restaurant food. Nothing else. But that, you know, like coming up to Chew and seeing you guys are standing in the pub and having a day out in the sun. <laughs> things like that, you know, or meeting that we do in the French house or, or our new one, the John Snow. <laughs> yeah, very good. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, I'm very much looking forward to a, 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 a pint or two. In, uh, but it won't Soho, be long now, but... John. It won't be long. A couple of weeks. A couple of weeks. Anyway, so that's that's done, I think. John, thank you ever so much Brilliant. for doing that. What a, I what a, we've what inspired a pleasure, what and enlightened a, a few people with our, with our words, because that's what this is all about. Yeah, well, thank you, Chris. Guys, I'm coming. Um, I'm just plugging myself back in. I'm all a bit unconnected. Yes. Sorry, I've got umbilical cords left, right, and centre, and I'm plugging myself back in. That was that was lovely. Really, this is this is like sort of um, Chris Sullivan chatting with his old mates, and it's just lovely sort of tapping back in there as well. And I, I just tweeted a comment that you made, John, actually, which I really loved about kids having no idea about a world where they were in the TV had total control over society and them. Fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we we say that art. Art is a combination of creativity, tools, and people. And I loved your creativity definition as well. So that tool was, if you like, it's cardboard, it's code, it's musical yeah. instruments, whatever. But if you think of tools or technology, and you, you've probably heard this one before, but technology is something that was invented after you were born. So for those cavemen in the Dordogne, 30,000 years BC, red paint on, a, on their hand as they daubed on the wall was technology because they didn't just discovered it. Absolutely. And we've got kids that, Absolutely. you know, I, I, you know, when you get parents, oh, look at him, he can use an iPhone. Well, it's because they've grown up with it. They're not super children. It's just, it's intuitive. Yeah. And, and I'd keep them off it as long as you can, if I were you. But <laughs> so, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so so yeah, there you go. And, so, and, and patience, you know, I think big kids, you know, can't stress it, you know, to get good at something, you do have to put in a bit of work and you have to be patient and you will have setbacks, but it's worth it in the end. You know, absolutely. Find, find, a, find a thing you love. And it's funny because I, I do, I, I, I know you do the Hay Book Festival stuff. I, I do some stuff around rockets. And there's a book that sort of literally changed my life and I, I needed to write a book pretty quickly. So I knocked it out in about four days. Threw, threw it into a PDF, emailed it to a printer, and got, and got a thousand copies back two days later. It's I mean, just it, nuts, can, isn't it's, it? It's, it's all nuts. possible. It's all possible. I haven't sold any because I haven't got a publisher promoting <laughs> it for me. <laughs> I didn't do it to sell them. I gave them all away. No, no, no. Thank you so exactly. much. Thank you so much for your time, John. I really do appreciate uh, it. Love, love being here. Good luck with the with the rest of the program. Fantastic. Fantastic. Check that tweet. Awesome. Check that tweet out, John, because I think you'll find it quite oh, interesting okay. when you see what we've done with that, and uh, and means a lot. Thank you so much. We've got to take this conversation no. out to schools and connect with people like you. Brilliant. Thanks so much. Bye bye. Brilliant. Thanks, Great. John. Cheers. Cheers. Bye, Chris. Thanks, John. Speak soon, huh? See you. See you soon, man. Cheers. Bye. All right, John. Nice one. Well, thank you sure. for that, Chris Sullivan. That's um, that's uh, two fire pit chats done. You've you've done us proud. Yeah, there. I'm that's... hoping that you know that will, if people are looking at it, it, will inspire some some inspire them. There's two people of like or three, me included, who've gone our own way and used used uh, creativity to further ourselves. And we both, we all of us, are kind of you know, doing what we want and are successful and are happy. And it just goes to show that no matter what your upbringing, you can. You know, if you've got your idea, you just need to push it, really. So I'm so a lot of people out there realise this, and uh, you know, that's what me, that's what the fundamental purpose of these both of these conversations were. And so tomorrow, I have another conversation with the two Kemp brothers, both of whom from Spandau Ballet, who basically they were. They, I went when I visited the, when I first met them in '79. I stayed in their their house, and they shared a bedroom. They lived in a three bedroom flat apartment, small, above. Uh, um, uh, news agents in Essex Road 
and then of course they went on Spandau Ballet and they became you know but actors but what got them out of that situation their dad was a cab driver mother was a housewife etc this was in the days when cab drivers by the way didn't earn as much money as they do now what got them out is that they went to Anna Cher School of Drama when they were both young kids because it was just down the street. So, um, and that's what opened them out. And their their whole lives and their wealth and their everything they've done has been directly attributed, can be directly attributed to uh, uh, creative teaching when they were young. So there'll be another two great examples. We'll be talking about this tomorrow at 7 p.m. So I hope you can all make it, those who are listening now. And... Uh, and afterwards, we have the great Danny Ramplin from Shum doing a two-hour set, which he's just sent me. So um, the, the tunes, he's going to do it tomorrow for you live. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I look forward to it. And I think, you've, uh, I think you've missed one person out, actually, Mr. Sullivan. Who have you missed out? Who do you reckon you've missed out? What? T tomorrow, tomorrow night. Yeah, who's the, who's the ultimate, who's the utter legend we've got on? tomorrow night oh, oh oh no no the reason is because you sorted that out you see so it's we got glenn matlock tomorrow my old friend who wrote the the song that that vivian westwood said it encapsulates the whole idea the greatest punk song ever according to vivian was pretty vacant which he wrote in its entirety so he's on tomorrow with earl slick doing a, a live set and Earl Slick was basically Bowie's main guitarist for many many years and uh, and he's you know he's a he's a, you know if the word legend you know amongst guitar aficionados he is certainly it so you got him and Glenn Glenn was one of the original Pistols founders as you know who's also uh, wrote, wrote a really good book was his uh, I was a teenage sex pistol uh, which is, I would highly recommend if you want to know the real story behind what happened in the punk days. Yeah, so that's tomorrow evening. Brilliant. What time is that one? Uh, uh, I, I'll be honest with you, I can't, let me have a look. I've got a program somewhere. Where do I put that? Oh, no, I haven't put the, tomorrow's stuff in. I think it's about, it's about, I think he's on at about 10, actually. I think we've gone late on that. And we've actually okay. just had, we've just had another really, really amazing guy confirmed, actually. And that's, um, mm. let me just press that there and take that down. Um, and that is, John McGoughlin, uh, oh, you know, I can't even remember his name now. I, I saw him play at a festival, funny enough, down by you, Bridge End. There's a, there's, oh, right, there's okay. a lovely little, um, a lovely sort of beach forest place and they had a festival there called Between the Trees and he played, and he plays a lot of the, he's, he's actually Irish, I think. He plays a lot of Irish folk songs about the mirth arising and all that sort of stuff. And oh, he's, right. He's well, I've a, written a script about that. Well, there you go. Know. That's what I thought I'd tell you. And, and also, um, he's... Um, Maybe I should interview him as well. <laughs> well, there you go. We should certainly check it out because you'd love it. It was, it was really pow powerful stuff. And he's got a lovely song called uh, Here Come the Young, which I thought was quite appropriate. So that's uh, tomorrow yes. night. Yes, well, you know, we are relying on the young. I was gratified to see that in a recent poll, they discovered that not one person born after 2000 voted for uh, the Tories. Really? Gosh. Not one person out of 10,000 people they canvassed. I couldn't possibly make a party political comment, but I'll leave that to you, Chris. Thank you very much for that. Uh, it's brilliant. Yes. Well, you know, I'm just saying it's young people. We, we want fact. to move forward through creativity, move into the 21st century and not, not dwell on the past. Absolutely. It, Chris, thank you very much. We'll see you tomorrow night, 7 o'clock. Speak to you tomorrow. Do me a favour, just night go, night. On, go on the Facebook and share all that. Check it out. See you, Chris. Thanks so, very much. Brilliant. Cheers. Bye-bye. Well, there we go. Friday, Friday night, fire pit chat's done. We're running five minutes late. We've got, we're going to Sheffield in a minute for a very, very special performance, a connection. We're going to meet um, Lenny's mum. Uh, you'll find out about Lenny in a moment. I'm just going to cut to the chase um, and wind this up now. And then we're going to go, I'm going to shut the stream down and then bring it back up again. Because the problem we've got is if, if ever we get any music that's copyright, we get shut down by YouTube. Um, she's understandable, fair enough, whatever, it's a bit of a pain. So the whole of this morning's been shut down because there was a five second clip on the back of BBC Radio Somerset. So I'm just gonna play a quick sort of 30 seconds, two seconds, wind up, and then we're gonna come straight back into an evening stuff. We've got an amazing lineup tonight. We've got a fantastic um, Windrush Jazz Symphony and the creative director behind that. We've got uh, Charlie Phillips, one of the Windrush generation. Um, he actually came to the first Glastonbury with Arabella Churchill, Winston Churchill's daughter, uh, granddaughter, I believe. And we have got Lenny's mum and we've got some talent from Fun Enough South Wales, a bit of a Wales thing. And no surprise really, Wales has 
just rolling out a new curriculum with creativity at its heart and we need some of that pretty badly as Chris said there we need to be inspiring connecting and getting our young children rocking and rolling so let's go 30 seconds and I'll shut down and we'll be back I'm just a dad and I passionately believe that the future for our children our communities and our country lies in one thing creativity it can inspire our kids in their learning it can create careers and connect communities 10 years ago after a trip to a festival camp festival i went back to my son's primary school and started a non-profit community enterprise called steamco with other parents teachers and local businesses we ran mini creativity festivals steamco helps connect our kids with their art and our communities with their schools last weekend in that same playground I filmed an amazing set by the legendary Glenn Matlock, co-founder of the Sex Pistols, and amazing global rock star Earl Slick, who used to play with David Bowie. It will be their performance at an event we've just been given permission to run in the playing fields of a school just down the road from Glastonbury. We're calling it Hashtag Your Glasto. It's one of five free three-day Art of Community festivals that we're running all summer with the help of the Arts Council and funding from the National Lottery. Our first one was live streamed from Eden Project at the end of May and featured inspiring talks, uplifting performances, creative activities and community engagement. We had a fantastic performance by the blind and disabled young woman Kerpa from Leeds we had a great Saturday night set from Emily Capel and Gaz Mayer even Skyped in from his hideaway in Wales. We had a right old laugh watching Rosemary Schrager teach Levoir to cook and we all split our sides with Basil Brush. Technology is an amazing thing. Punk icon Jar Wobble chatted with a granddad in Liverpool. On Sunday we had a little big lunch and after that rock star activator Tom Morley led a co-drum circle with 